will uh, leave it there for now, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Chair. I call uh, Mika Fightieri. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you for the opportunity to um, make some comments on Part 6, sir. And of course, uh, the Minister explained last night the purpose of Part 6. I won't uh, uh, rehash what he explained it, but it is a critical part of this piece of legislation, uh, Mr. Chair, because this is the, the part that talks about the, the role of the governance body. It talks about uh, their responsibilities. It talks about the kaitiakis or the trustees that are appointed to the governance roles. It talks about distribution of, of dividends that may be uh, uh, conjured up. So this part six year, is really critical that uh, we examine it uh, in the way that it deserves to be examined because it is clear that Māori owners have been told through this particular clause how to manage their land. That's what they've been told, sir. And so it's important, uh, as much as we possibly can, to ask the questions of clarity from the minister in the seat around the particular clauses that um, I'm about to go into. And I just don't want to repeat my colleague, Calvin Davis, sir, but when he went through uh, clause 202, uh, in terms of um, the question around which owners. So we're talking about 202 uh, in, in terms of um, 1 double A, where we mention benefits of the owner. My question to the Minister, which owner are we talking about? Are we talking about the legal owner or the beneficiary owner? And I need to draw the Minister's um, attention to clause 47 on the bill, where in clause 47 he outlines the rights of owners in terms of uh, 41 uh, clause 47, 1 A to D, and then he has a uh, sub clause 2 of clause 47 where he talks about land being managed by the governance body. So it'd be really good to hear from the Minister uh, clarity around um, whether we're talking about legal or beneficiary owners in relation to clause 202. Sir, so, and I want to turn um, uh, the House's attention to clause 204. 204, uh, sir, talks about the trustees, kaitiakis, personal liability. Um, so it talks about, uh, uh, obviously, kaitiaki or trustees of these governance bodies are exempt or, or exempt, uh, personally exempt from liability. Um, and in clause 204, it explains that. Uh, clause 205 then talks about the immunity of owners from personal liability uh, in 205. So my question to the Minister is if the trustees on these governance boards that Māori landowners are going to be forced to have are not liable, and then if the owners uh, in Clause 205 are not personally liable, then who is there? Who is if something goes dreadfully wrong in terms of the governance board and the governance arrangement, and there's something untoward. It's unclear uh, in the part as to who is liable. So we're clear on who isn't. My question to the minister is therefore who is. Turning to clause 206, sir. 206. Um, it was really um, reading clause 206, uh, subsects 1, A, and B, and just so that I understood. Um, as I read that, and of course the Minister may be able to correct me, um, the question around uh, certain parcels of land, uh, so we got uh, 2061A, uh, where we talk about the governance body can decide to hold Māori freehold land in one or more parcels, um, or land acquired to be acquired by the body by way of a gift or purchase. Um, and then in B, we talk about one or more parcels of land other than Māori freehold land that is already held by the body under governance arrangement. And the question that those, that particular clause, sir, came for me was, um, does this protect the, um, I use the foundation, but the original owners um, within the governance group, um, if the governance entity decides to set up a separate entity? Um, does this particular clause protect against the ability of a governance um, a board, a body uh, able to set up a separate entity. Um, so I'll just leave that there for the Minister to answer. Um, clause 206, uh, subclause 2, as soon as practical after making is the beginning of that uh, subclause. When you turn over the page, sir, into clause uh, 3 of 206, subclause 3, we've got within one month after the letter. There are quite a few um, clauses in this particular part, sir, um, that had uh, 
specific times, either within one month, and then in other clauses that had as soon as possible. Um, so, uh, whether the minister's considered, um, <coughs> Mr. Chair. Make a part, Terry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Whether the minister. Um, uh, and I will come to my uh, amendments that are tab uh, tabled amendments because I've tried to offer up some suggestions to the minister around where we are making time, uh, specifying time limits, and in other areas we're not. And 206 sub clause <coughs> 2 is an example of what I'm just talking about, Mr Chair, where we've got the word as soon as practical after making the decision, whereas when you turn over the page to 3, we're saying within one month after, um, after the Governance Board agreement and sends the amendment to the Chief Executive for registration. So uh, that, that's a question for the Minister. Uh, in terms of 207, Will we talk about requirements of governance body sales or exchanges passes of Māori freehold land? Um, when I look at the, um, the the definition in this particular clause, um, I get there's a bit of a mixing between selling and exchanging in the explanation of clause 207. Um, be, simply because, sir, if you look at 207, well, the minister looks at 207. Um, and if we go down to, if a governance body sells a parcel land, freehold land, this is sub clause two, the body must, as soon as practical after the sale, use the net proceeds from the sale to acquire, improve, or acquire and improve the replacement land identified in the allocation scheme required under section 1043B. The question I have to the minister is, um, you know, for me that's sounding like we're telling uh, the governance body um, if they're selling land, then they must do something with the sales, and I'm not too sure uh, what part of the principle, the Tino Tino principle, that that particular clause 207, 2, um, A, uh, 1 and B actually meets. And so the minister may have some thoughts on that. If I move to 208, clause 208, uh, where we talk about requirements in cases of partition, amalgamation or boundary adjustments of Māori freehold land and the governance arrangement. Um, when I look at uh, clauses 208, sub-clause 1 and 2, um, the question I have is because it talks about um, what this section applies to in terms of partition amalgamations, um, adjustments. The question I have here, uh, Minister, is where is the notification consultation with owners uh, in terms of Clause 208? Uh, it doesn't mention it, of course, I know. Um, it may be contained somewhere else in the bill. Uh, but one of the, one of the considerations I, I would have thought that the governance uh, body has is a duty to notify and consult with owners if we're going into partition, uh, partitions, amalgamation or boundary adjustments uh, of Māori freehold land. So I'll leave that for the Minister to, uh, to answer. Uh, in 209, uh, 209 sub-clause 2C3, uh, we've got this a statement that says, in a way that is fair and equitable to all the owners, um, this is in relation to, we're talking now about the allocation scheme, sir, about uh, designing um, the interest, um, the land that will be utilised, the allocation adjustment of the uh, ownership of the parcel. And of course it talks about allocation or just the ownership of the parcel in a way that is fair and equitable to all owners. And I guess the question I have to the Minister is, what does that look like? How would fair and equitable to all owners be tested? Um, and, and again, maybe the um, minister would uh, have a response uh, in due time. And of course, 2A uh, of, of clause 209, we're talking about section 1028 overrides subsection 2B and C. And I guess when I've read back 1028, and, and the subsections 2B and C, um, it, it, it doesn't appear to be any difference between um, uh, what it's overriding with. So I guess the question I had is, is why we got that particular clause, 209 2A, um, in, in that particular uh, clause. Uh, Sue, so I've got, um, I'm only on page uh, 106, 
And in terms of part six, we've got another 20 or 18 pages to go. Um, I'm going to take my seat because I know some colleagues have got some questions, um, but I do want to come back to you. I've got a suite, like I said in my opening statement, of tabled amendments for this particular part. I'd like the opportunity to uh, talk to all of them. They've been designed in a way uh, for some uh, semblance across this part, uh, part six, and also uh, some concerns that I haven't yet raised, but hopefully I will get the opportunity to. I call uh, Marima Davidson. Thank you very much, Mr Chair. I've